Um, I want to thank uh, all of you, I mean, for inviting me, of course, first of all, and for arranging this uh, really amazing uh, event. It's really well done, and it's immensely interesting and uh, very insightful presentations that I simply have been absorbing and uh, try trying to comprehend. I'm not that much of a Hegelian myself, so I got a little bit uneasy when we started out by discussing whether Ljubljana should be renamed to Hegeliana yesterday. Um, and it also uh, reminded me of, well, being a Dane probably, about Kierkegaard's own uneasiness with the Hegelianism of his contemporary Copenhagen, which I think maybe we could call Copenhagen, actually, <laughs> at, at least to, to Kierkegaard. And, and I, then I reminded there was something Kierkegaard said somewhere, and I tried to find it, and it's true in the concluding unscientific postscript, Johannes Klimakus, who is the author of uh, the postscript, Kierkegaard's pseudonym, uh, reassures us at one point in the book, quote, that, quote, the system is being worked on, and it should certainly be complete by Sunday. So I think... <laughs> Maybe this is also more or less the ambition here that we will be finished by Sunday. Um, and I have to admit that my contribution to sort of finalizing the system is very modest. I do actually start from a Hegelian uh, point, um, but almost like a MacGuffin that just will get me started and trying to use this kind of Hegelian motif to maybe explore some thoughts by including other authors along the way which is also, by the way, very much, I think, what Kierkegaard uh, did. He was much more of a Hegelian than some people think. Um, so, but what I want to do is to try and uh, explore and hopefully expose some dangers I see in how academic research and education are currently being affected by bureaucratic and economic regimes, or I think by what Mladen earlier today called uh, the university discourse run amok, uh, and I will focus on the university discourse within the university itself and try to characterize something like this running amok, I think, as what I will call a meta-quantification of the university work, but that will be hopefully much more clear in a little bit. So I will start from Hegel. In his Science of Logic, Hegel describes how quantity changes into quality. Changes in nature have mistakenly been conceptualized merely as gradual increases or disappearances, he says, but this understanding fails to acknowledge the real breaks that actually occur. Nature works not only in continuous flows of more or less, but also in more radical shifts where quantitative changes suddenly result in qualitative shifts. This break or rupture or instantaneous change is, quote, ein Anderswerden, das ein Abbrechen des Allmählichen und ein qualitativ anderes gegen das vorhergehende Dasein ist. So a becoming other, which is a break with the gradual process and a qualitatively different being against the previous, unquote. Hegel himself offers the, the example of the change of water into ice. The quantitative change of temperature at some point results in the qualitative change of the state of the matter. Water changes into ice at the freezing point, auf einmal, as Hegel says, and similarly, of course, it changes into steam at the other end, at the boiling point. Qualitative changes like the ones encountered in physics, chem chemistry, or biology can also be observed in human societies. In anthropology, for example, it has been shown uh, how historically the size of a population can affect the quality of its social structures. A village that has increased its population beyond a certain threshold might start functioning badly and require either separation into two villages or the invention of new institutions or forms of regulation. Political revolutions could also be seen as results of quantitative changes culminating in qualitative shifts. Like Bukharin wrote, they do not fall from the sky, quote, they are prepared by the entire preceding course of development as the boiling of water is prepared by the preceding process of heating, or as the explosion of a steam boiler is prepared by the increasing pressure of the steam against its walls, unquote. 
So I think something similar could also be said about science and education. Isn't Thomas Kuhn's description of normal science a description of accumulation of data, knowledge, and understanding within the frames of a paradigm until the limits of the paradigm itself has been reached and a new conceptualization is needed. Scientific revolutions do not fall from the sky either, although one might sometimes be forgiven for thinking so with images of genius scientists at the receiving end of falling apples from trees, etc. Uh, revolu scientific revolutions have been prepared, and even if scientific breakthroughs in important ways happen auf einmal, they would not appear without meticulous, long-lasting and patient work within the frames of certain established sets of assumptions and ways of thinking. In effect, there are thus two kinds of scientific progress, what could be termed knowing more and knowing differently, respectively, neither of which is sufficient without the other. Knowing more means adding on data, information, knowledge, while knowing differently means acquiring a new framework for understanding the meaning of the information obtained, or indeed for what counts as information in the first place. If there is a crisis in contemporary university discourse, and I think there is, its most prevalent trait is probably the exhaustion of the ability to know differently. It follows from the preceding argument that such an ability, in an important sense, cannot be separated from the ability to know more. We do need to know more in order for any significant progress to be possible, but knowing more does not have much scientific value without some integrated sense of a direction towards knowing differently. So the two are related, but they do not condition each other in the same way. Maybe an analogy can serve to illustrate the asymmetrical relation between them. Immanuel Kant said that we know of freedom, even if freedom cannot be theoretically proven, because we are able to imagine the moral law, and the law is thereby what he calls the ratio cognoscendi of freedom. The moral law, in turn, would not really be moral at all if it were not for freedom. Freedom is thus the ratio essendi of morality. Similarly, knowing more is the way in which or the path along which we become able to contemplate something differently, while the potential of knowing differently is the essential component of knowing more if it is to be counted as scientific knowledge. Freedom to Kant is a way of breaking off from natural determination, and similarly, science appears in the first place as a way of breaking off from mythological or ideological explanations and it has continued to revolutionize its own foundation. As a scientist, you collect data, analyze, reflect, write, discuss, because you want to establish some truth that you may only vaguely discern, an answer to a question which you are still not able to formulate. Or maybe more precisely, as a scientist, you do ask concrete questions and expect concrete answers. You do clarify concepts and compare, measure, estimate, etc. This is what Thomas Kuhn calls mop-up work. But without the always potentially relevant question that has not yet been asked, this work would not be genuinely scientific. What does this mean, or how can it be so? In a slogan, the genuinely scientific thought is not, I understand, but on the contrary, I do not understand. Which is, of course, also why, in Lacanian terms, it's the hysterics discourse that produces knowledge, whereas the university discourse rather circulates knowledge at least at a later stage in Lacan, or in the f formal description of the discourses. Knowledge is on the place of the product in the hysterics discourse. When Lacan talks about S2, the battery of signifiers, that is the agent in university discourse, he's talking, quote, about those signifiers that are already there, unquote. Knowledge is something given in university discourse. It is already there, at least in its basic definitions and frames. Although the hysteric is thus the agent that pushes for new knowledge, it is not necessarily the hysteric that causes or identifies actual breakthroughs. Going back to Hegel's dictum, maybe the hysteric's discourse is the one that pushes the quantitative increase of knowledge to its limit, whereas something else is needed to execute the qualitative change. For this to happen, something like an intervention is required, which maybe enables a certain reformulation, Allah, is this what you are saying? 
for example, what if it is not just an anomaly or imprecision in our measurements that electrons seem to be able to appear as particles and waves at the same time? What if it is an ontological question about the nature of matter? The discourse of the analyst produces master signifiers, not because it produces new knowledge, but because it enables a certain recognition of what has been produced, almost a reconciliation. Maybe this is it. The university discourse, in its pure form, without hysteria, without masters and without interventions, could be said to be the one in which the change from quantity to quality does not or only rarely occur. Instead, scientific production tends to remain within more or less established frames where conceptual shifts are no longer necessarily the aim. This is what I'm afraid we're beginning to see in academia. We get loads of knowledge, but nothing really happens. We could almost call this a shift from quality to quantity or to quantification without the essential ingredient of the absolute. To be precise, quantification itself is not the problem, certainly not in the natural and mathematical sciences, but not in a broader sense either. We quantify whenever we repeat certain figures, define, infer, and conclude. A literary analysis might, for example, surely consist in quantifications to a significant degree. Why is this string of signifiers repeated several times in the poem? Why do the sentences become shorter in this chapter? How many inclinations of this verb are possible, etc.? The problem is rather a kind of meta-quantification, a quantification of results as products that can be counted, controlled, and compared, which effectively encourages, if not even forces, scientists to, to remain on the level of the gradual changes that characterize the moderate state of affairs between extremities, like lukewarm water that never becomes too hot or too cold. In other words, the problem is that academics are rarely given time and incentive to pursue a track until its ultimate conclusions. Instead, they try to stay on ground that is more likely to ensure objective outputs. And my favorite example of this is uh, British physicist Peter Higgs, the Nobel Prize winning discoverer of the Higgs boson, who in, 2000, in a 2013 interview with The Guardian said, that he would probably not qualify for a job like his own today because he wouldn't be considered productive enough. One of the most important engines of this process is the funding mechanism that has infiltrated more or less the entire academic world over the past decades. In order to obtain funding for your research, you need to apply for research donations from public or private foundations. And in such application, applications, you must outline the benchmarks timelines, work packages, partial results, and plans for publications three or more years ahead of the actual research. This is not necessarily invalidating for the research that will eventually be conducted, but it is nonetheless striking how elaborately a project must be rolled out along the lines of the language of the contemporary situation. In a way, this language is even doubly restricted, for the objectives of your project must also be formulated in ways that are understandable to peers that are not necessarily up to date on exactly those theories that you want to engage in your problem solving. Paradoxically, therefore, researchers are required to present themselves as both more insightful than they really are, like some kind of agents of, I think what Lacan calls tout savoir, knowing everything, uh, being able to overview detailed elements of a comprehensive future research process and simultaneously making themselves more stupid than they really are because they must refrain from telling everything they know or think or plan or dream, aspire of, which I think resembles, although I think it is not a precise representation, but it somehow resembles, I think, what Alice Bunta has called the artificial stupidity of the first order. Admittedly, some of these process in the processes in the funding procedure are to a certain extent meaningful just like the peer review processes in most journals and the exchanges at conferences such as this. So sharpening your point, clarifying your aims, structuring your work are not bad ways of spending time. In a specific sense, I would actually say that many of these mechanisms probably do improve the projects and papers that are produced seen in isolation. But they also, by definition, involve a change of focus from, let us say, truth to output. And I think one should add to this the endless amounts of hours spent 
for drafts and applications that end up not being funded, with success rates not unusually lingering around 5 to 10 percent. A study from the Economics of Education Review from 2008 showed that U.S. academics already then spend more than four hours per week on average for grant writing. A study from Australia from 2012 showed that an estimated 550 years of work was put into a call from the National Health and Medicine Research Council, and there was a high success rate of 21%, but still 79% of 550 years is quite a lot of work gone lost. In a rather concrete sense, most of this work represents a case of working for free. Research foundations need unsuccessful applications to justify awarding their preferred choices with significant capital. The meta quantification that I have tried to describe is a, what I would call a pseudo commodification. Academic achievements have become commodities, or more precisely, pseudo commodities. They are counted, compared, and rewarded as if they were commodities, although we know very well that they are not commodities. A paper in a highly rated journal is not something a scientist produces with the literal aim of selling it. And even if some journals are in fact retrieving their contents for free and selling the access rights to the eventual publications back to the institutions at high prices, this is not exactly the same like a system of production in which capitalists are extracting surplus value from poor workers that are not paid for the full value of that which they produce, because the authors are usually not employed by the journals at all, but usually by universities. To a large degree, however, internally in the academic institution, uh, institutions, we behave as if our products were commodities. They are defined and assessed in quantitative terms that assign value to them, not exactly monetary value, but something that sometimes comes very close. Papers are quantified in relation to national indexes. Conferences are entire little enterprises of their own with an elaborate economy of funding, renting facilities, accommodation. Researchers get awards or bonuses for outstanding achievements, etc. Everything has a price, although it is never sold. The pseudo-commodification of the university system thus has the subtle implication that we are encouraged to think of our products like commodities, but are also constantly reminded that they are of course not commodities. And so we should simultaneously maintain a sense of loyalty towards colleagues and attend their lectures, peer review papers for free, and be ready to help students with special needs, and so on. At the end of the day, the pseudo-commodified university entails that academics are spending an increasing amount of their time and focus for collecting points of various kinds, which will increase their chances of promotion, or at least decrease the risk of being made redundant. And this is very uh, actual for me right now. Just within the last week, there were two news from home. We have a s allegedly social democratic government, um, which has announced that it wants to cut uh, approximately half of the master's degrees course uh, programs in humanities with one year, so you can get a master's after bachelor in one year instead of two, is their plan, they didn't introduce it yet. And simultaneously in Aarhus University, uh, the pedagogical section where one of our common friends, Kirsten Hülgaard, is employed, has announced that they will cut 22 positions until uh, before the new year. So this is really what is going on now very much in my place and you hear the stories from different places gradually. Martin Heidegger's <clears throat> famous somewhat derogatory comment that science doesn't think should today maybe be qualified a little bit by saying rather that scientists would have liked to think but are not really able to. Bureaucracy doesn't think. Instead it administers the law of the prevailing order and in so doing it has been remarkably successful in bureaucratizing science itself as well. There's one more point in bringing up Hegel's analysis of the shift from quantity to quality, namely that what he describes are events in nature. Nature itself is a system of transitions from state to state where the gradual increase or decrease in quantity inevitably leads to changes in quality. If we apply this understanding directly to science in a naive naturalist reading, it becomes evident, evident that a significant effort is in fact needed if one wants to prevent science from transgressing its own boundaries. It is against its nature, so to say, to be polite, pragmatic, and sensible, 
and therefore artificial measures have to be invented and installed to stop scientists from aiming at objectives beyond what is realistic and understandable. Such a naturalist reading could of course be refined quite a bit by more precise definitions of science as not simply natural occurrences like running water or ant colonies, but rather a deviation from nature or nature's own deviation from itself to echo Alenka Subhanchit's description in What is Sex? But the point would basically be the same. Scientists have to become artificially stupid in order to restrict themselves from approaching their work with the drive that characterizes science. And I use the phrase artificial stupidity here in a Kierkegaardian sense. Kierkegaard has a number of wonderful passages on stupidity. In one of them, he actually, like Bunza, uses the formulation artificial stupidity, by which he means the kind of stupidity that can only be acquired after elaborate studies and a stern belief in the perfectibility of the prevailing understanding. In another, he par par parodies the often heard common praise of especially talented or outstanding people who would have known that this little child possesses such excellence. To say instead, and this is actually a quote from Kierkegaard, although in one of his journals, but nonetheless, quote, no one knew who would have thought of it, that in this child who was very much like others, there was such a resource of stupidity, which we now in the course of the years witness unfolding in ever richer ways, unquote. Overall, stupidity is the product of what we might call Pascalian measures of everyday academic bureaucracy, in which academics gradually unlearn their incentives to be creative and persistent. How do you learn to believe in the organizational philosophy of postmodern university systems? You kneel in front of your computer, open your Excel sheet, and fill in the registration of your time spent for various tasks. Universities have become entire enterprises with their own uh, administrative logic of operation, which increasingly works on the level of meta-quantification, and thereby they import tendencies of what Alveson and Spicer have called functional stupidity from other kinds of organizations. Functional stupidity, Alveson and Spicer write, quote, entails a ref refusal to use intellectual resources outside a narrow and safe terrain. It can provide a sense of certainty that allows organizations to function smoothly. This can save the organization and its members from the frictions provoked by doubt and reflection, unquote. In education, we see similar trends to those in research, although they play out somewhat differently. If research establishes new master signifiers, education generally rather engages with already established discourses and concepts. The normal neurotic student is the hysteric who bombards their professors with questions, and thereby they do contribute to the production of knowledge, but usually not as the one who defines the analytical, analytic in intervention itself. Even when students have original ideas, they are often consciously or unconsciously stolen by their professors. However, there's also a certain passage in academic education, ideally at least, in which you pass from the position of the hysteric to something that resembles that of the analyst. That is from questioning, but also acquiring the received prevailing knowledge to being able to identify whenever something new is appearing. In order to pass through this passage, you need to change your relation to the master signifier. One way of describing this passage, although not in Lacanian terms, has been elaborated by Ray Land, who is a professor of higher education at the University of Durham in England. Land and some of his colleagues have identified a number of what they call threshold concepts that they find to be essential to various academic disciplines. Such concepts, quote from Land, can be considered akin to a portal, opening up a new and previously inaccessible way of thinking about something. It, the threshold concept represents a transformed way of understanding without which the learner cannot progress and invariably involves a shift in the learner's subjectivity or sense of self. As a consequence of comprehending a threshold concept, there is a transformed internal view of a subject matter, subject landscape, or even worldview." Unquote. The metaphor of the threshold has something in common with the view of a passage that I mentioned. You pass to the other side, and after passing, you see the world differently. Like what I described as knowing differently in relation to research, this transformation, according to Land, quote, may be sudden or protracted with the transition to understanding often involving troublesome knowledge, unquote. Simplifying a little bit, maybe we could call knowing differently 
in relation to research, it's phylogenetic dimension. We all, as humanity, know differently when some scientific breakthrough has occurred, while the student's way of knowing differently could be called the ontogenetic dimension. Basically, as a student, you pass a threshold as a conclusion of a lengthy engagement with difficult material. Each discipline has its own threshold concept or concepts. Land offers examples like evolution in biology, gravity or uncertainty in measurement in physics, precedent in law, and deconstruction in literature. The point being that when you have really grasped these concepts, and only then, you are able to understand the fundamental questions of the discipline. In psychoanalysis, the threshold concept would of course be the unconscious, and in philosophy, we would probably find a host of different such concepts depending on the school of thought. Clearly, these concepts are historically and contextually variable, such that not only do they change the learner's subjectivity, they are themselves a result of a subjective effort. Nonetheless, they represent something of essential importance to academic education, I would claim. The prolonged effort to grasp something that initially transcends the horizon of one's understanding. Threshold concepts change the learner's subjectivity because they require what might, one might even call a traversing of an entire field of knowledge. Grasping a threshold concept therefore all ha also has implications for how you understand a host of other concepts and questions. After you have grasped the concept of evolution, for example, there are certain beliefs, even systems of belief, that you can no longer uphold. This is all well and good. The problem with threshold concepts, however, is, like already indicated, that they demand consistent efforts and time to be grasped. Students may get the gist to some extent without really getting it, and there's an unavoidable period of what Land describes as liminality connected to these efforts. You start seeing that there's something new or other that you might want to learn, and maybe you lose a little bit of confidence in your former ways of seeing things. The danger is that without the proper guidance, effort, and time spent, the student risks never exiting this state again. Quote from Land again, difficulty in understanding threshold concepts may leave the learner in a state of liminality, a suspended state or stock place in which understanding approximates to a kind of mimicry or lack of understanding. As a teacher, this is generally where you would not like to leave your students, in the state of liminality. But it is nevertheless where more and more students risk ending, the more their education is emptied of extended and in-depth studies of difficult texts and problems. Except for the personal unease this might leave the student in, it also contributes to the dissemination of half-baked theories about themes they might have studied but not completely grasped. The widespread hatred of the thinking of, say, Jacques Derrida and Judith Butler is most likely generated from an exhaustion of listening to unfinished thoughts about the inexistence of truth or the social construction of sex, for example. In the teaching process itself, and especially in the exam, the state of liminality also complicates things. Like Land says, quote, it can be hard to know whether they have got it or not, unquote when one is assessing students who are still in the face of liminality. They might be able to say some of the right things, but do they know their implications? Students, on the other hand, have, might feel misunderstood or even disrespected when they're not given credit for the work they have actually done. The title of my paper, Master, Don't You See That I'm Learning, in this context represents a cry from the student who is left alone without the appropriate amount of feedback and is frustrated that they cannot really advance further even if they are really trying. The product of the university discourse is the split subject. So who is to blame for this development? The shortest answer to that question is probably that it is someone else. In university discourse, as Lacan defined it, the master is hiding under the bar. He is present as absent in the sense that he can be invoked when there is a need of legitim legitimization but the master is rarely issuing direct orders. Rather, and more precisely, the master is a signifier, a referral, an explanation of the need for doing like the neutral agents in university discourse must do. Like the boss of it all in Lars von Trier's film, the master in university discourse is an evasive figure that always seems to be managing things from a distance. We are committed to adhering to the curricula, the guidelines from the study board, the administrative limitations on the time spent for actual teaching and supervision, public and po political demands for the employability of students, 
And indeed, in the broader sense, the Bologna process with its standardizations, credit systems, and emphasis on explicit skills and competences. The combined pressures of these various factors are gradually turning many universities into vocational schools in which the primary aim is to prepare students for occupations of almost any kind. Or in the words of Jeff Boucher, quote, the university discourse is a discourse of interpolation, that is, of the formation of subjects to serve a social order, unquote. The second interpretation of my title would therefore be even worse. Master, don't you see that I'm learning? would mean that the student is actually acquiring the skills and competences that the system is designed to teach her. In this scenario, the state of liminality is not a passage. It is the desired outcome of the student's training. She is supposed to be flexible, adaptable, creative, and able to engage with more or less any field without aiming for any kind of fundamental change, neither of herself nor of the context she is engaging with, let alone, of course, society at large. Just to take one, I think, symptomatic example of this tendency, which I have from a reliable source, namely my wife. Uh, in, in literature studies at Copenhagen University a couple of years ago, the lecturers, and she was one of them, were required to present their readings in a tapas course, where students could read a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but without being expected to really engage profoundly with any of it. Maybe this is what we can expect from the future, the Tapas University. In the worst case, we might end up with candidates that would really have been better off without a higher education at all. So, then the last point. There is just one more thing, like Detective Colombo would say, the master signifier. I have been handling it more or less as, as if it was something that someone, the scientist, produced and others, the students, needed to grasp but this story should be elaborated a little bit in at least a couple of respects. First of all, we certainly do not understand master signifiers in the same way that we understand knowledge in the broad sense, S2. For example, we do not understand the concept of the unconscious in the same way that we understand that Foucault was born in 1926 or that Aristotle operates with four different concepts of causality. Indeed, master signifiers are strictly speaking, quote from uh, Bruce Fink, nonsensical signifiers with no rhyme or reason. And it might therefore even seem appropriate to divorce the concept of the master signifier from land's threshold concepts altogether. Nonetheless, although the two concepts are certainly different, I think it does make sense to at least emphasize some of the traits of the master signifier a bit more than land does when talking about threshold concepts, even in his own examples. One reason is the effect of retroactivity that I have already touched upon. The master signifier is not so much a new insight or understanding as it is the acknowledgement of an insight which is already there. It adds the dot to the eye, so to say. And so the master signifier is merely a name for the entire process of understanding that someone has undergone when it can, when it can finally be concluded. And I thought of here uh, what Mladen once explained in an interview we made, we made with him about absolute knowledge in the phenomenology of spirit. Uh, being sort of the punct, the full stop at the end of the book, which just retroactively shows that everything was there along the way. And maybe you could say that in this sense, absolute knowledge in a way is the master signifier, like a threshold concept uh, could also be described as a master signifier when it's only sort of the name for that which you have now been going through, so to say. Another reason, however, for importing the master signifier, so to say, into Lenz, uh, descriptions, is that the inscrutability of the master signifier is maybe not that far away from Land's concept as it might at first appear. Do we really understand Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, for example? I admit that physicists, of course, understand much more precise and specific things than I do when they deal with the principle. But even they, let us say that the Big Bang is a threshold concept in astronomy. Let us say that you are the leading scientist on the field is it even possible that you understand all the implications of this theory? What was in the beginning? What was before the beginning? In other words, don't fundamental concepts like these necessarily contain a dimension of the inconceivable as well? Without becoming entirely Heideggerian, couldn't we say that there's only understanding when something eludes us as well? If there is a modest political lesson from all this, maybe it is that 
science does not work and does not create the progress that society expects from it if it is turned into ready-mades and commodified, and that education urgently needs to be defended and maybe even redesigned to avoid permanent states of liminality with forced expressions of apparent understanding. Instead, it would be much more productive to educate students with a firm grasp of that which they do not understand. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Henrik, for opening this very, very important topic. Yeah, Peter. Um, okay, I'll give you mine. It's closer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Henrik, for being here. It's always a pleasure to listen to your talks. And you always open new perspectives. And I think that the one that you just opened uh, suits well with this conference, because we are all working in these fields that you are referring to. Uh, I don't have any questions to you, maybe just three or four remarks, if you allow me. Uh, of course, I think that the title of the, your conference refers to Freud's famous dream about the father and the son. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you should put the slash and nonetheless put it burning. Because yeah. what we are facing in the field of uh, research is uh, the burnout phenomenon. So because of this... Uh, processes you just described, we are somehow forced to work 24-7 in a way. I don't know if people are familiar with uh, our Slovenian system of acquiring uh, funds for research, and uh, this is a story that we are telling all the time for 20 years to everybody who comes to Slovenia, and nobody understands it fully. Uh, I will be very brief. So. I'm working at the institute, and institute is funded by the research agency. And we are funded in two ways, either via programs who last six years or with the projects who are three-year projects. And to acquire progress, uh, pro pro uh, these um, projects, you have to uh, con go to concourse by the research agency and be the best. So be to have the best evaluation and find money. The problem is that with the crisis 2008, the funds dropped significantly. So the crisis came to Slovenia in 2009, 2010, and the concourse, who should be every year at each time precisely, suddenly dropped from 23 million for the whole science to 10 million. And 10 years didn't rise up at all. So uh, it, it was risen, I don't know, to 12 million, and now it's Maybe it's a little more, I don't know. I think we are here almost. So this is the context. Uh, what, we are, uh, what we are facing is a kind of process of quantity going to quality. And uh, I think this is a process that we should trace since the my 68, in a way. There is a reference in Lacan's 17th seminar to the students, always they refer to you are looking for the master. But he's referring to that they are, they are searching only for the credit points. And the credit points are, are actually now in the system, system which is somehow searching, not producing knowledge, but producing workforce who would be flexible enough to, to, uh, to find new uh, Okay, to deal with new uh, jobs, etc. So, just, I'll be very brief. I'm sorry for talking too much. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the study by Jean-Claude Milner and Jacques-Alain Miller, Voulez-vous être évalué? So, they are, they are, the evaluation is a word that they are, that similar echoes your meta-quantification in a way. So, evaluation is everywhere, and this refers to this infamous reform that was planned in 2003 and every uh, psychoanalytic rise rise up uh, this is a completely different story what i want to say is also that in slovenia somehow we are evaluated by the points we make as researchers this forces us to publish as much as possible and in that way we are not able to work really thoroughly on a material or in, on a subject and uh, the problem is that somehow these points are acquired via so-called um, universal 
quantificational measures like Scopus, etc., and giving impact factors to reviews. And if you search uh, in more detail, you find out that you practically not, this is not a public uh, scene or, pub or universal domain, but in fact, private capitalized project par excellence. And uh, in that way, and uh, if Kafka would be alive, he would be, he would, he would not written the castle, he would write the Scopus. Because they don't, don't answer any, <laughs> they really don't answer on any complaint, on every, they are simply unreachable. And the same applies to Facebook, etc. Et mm. So that, that's my, that was my short point. Uh, uh, I have a lot to say to yeah. all of them, but I will try to sort of just say maybe a little bit that about this whole uh, grant system. I mean, I started looking into some of the investigations that it seems to me that people are beginning to actually do more serious studies now, quantifying sort of how much money is going into this, how much time is spent for uh, making applications, how many percentage, uh, and how much work is really wasted, and so on. And I saw one, I, I cannot give you the reference, so I'm, I have to be a little bit careful, but I saw in one of these uh, studies that it was actually, the, the conclusion of that was, first of all, that the sort of the pretended objectivity of the evaluation of such grant proposals is far overrated. That it was simply put like this, that reviewers disagree. So some reviewers, if they have a preference for that field, might agree with something that others would not have granted. So, and second point there was that even if you look again on the outputs in measure, measurable entities, for example, quotations, uh, it's not necessarily so that research that is granted with significant public or private funds is actually more effective than research that is coming out of basic, ordinary university scholars' work. Then, um, yeah, and related to that, I mean, this is also something that's beginning to become more and more evident in Denmark, for example, that even in our most respected universities, the old Copenhagen University and in Aarhus University, we have now more and more cases of uh, pharmaceutical industry and agriculture, especially those two sort of directly. So there's two problems. Directly, of course, <laughs> de defining, deciding to some extent with some uh, length, arm's length principle, but still who will get funding for what. And as, an, as a spillover effect from that, the universities have to pay immense overheads for uh, the, the general uh, working of the university facilities, and uh, it means that even more of the funding is being allocated from basic grants also to these kind of privately sponsored. And there are some cases of, you know, directly cases of scientific fraud almost that, that, that some private actors are now beginning to directly uh, manipulate with the results and demand that they would be part of editing the <laughs> papers and so on. So th there's a lot of stuff going on here, I would say. Great, thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Simon and then you uh, Thank you, Henrik, for for a great and uh, unsettling talk. I mean, you you, you describe the reality that uh, researchers are living uh, to to a fine detail into a fine detail. Uh, I just have a couple of points. I mean, uh, obvious to me that you I liked your the transition that you that you mentioned from truth as the focus of scientific research to output, and I think you absolutely agreed with Peter's point. So it's from truth to output to burnout. So that's kind of the gradation of it. But that's just an aside. Um, two, uh, I would like to make two points. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned an interesting, uh, I, I think there was an ambivalence in, in the way you spoke, um, spoke about the university matter. Um, on the one hand, there's the easy way of um, um, understanding or interpreting these developments as a form of simple commod commodification. So a, a, a kind of a transposition of capitalist logic into uh, the sphere of the university. But one thing strike, uh, strike me as very interesting, you said everything has a price without being sold. And I think this accounts for a kind of a difference, a delicate difference that you were trying to address. And uh, so my question in this regard would be, so there is a kind of an extra economic economy that pertains to university life. Yeah. So it's a domain not so much of calculability in this precise sense, but also uh, you know, calculating the incalculable. 
So it has to do more with the economy of gift and theft mm -hmm. than with the rational, yeah. uh, let's say, um, accounting of things. So this would be th uh, the first thing. And, and, and the second question relates to Lacan's use of the, uh, or uh, Lacan's idea of the university discourse. And you spoke about the master being kind of pushed underneath the barrier, kind of uh, in an op existing, but existing in a very opaque position that um, that is never uh, uh, that the students or the subjects never gain true access to, right? Yeah. Um, so I do, to some degree, uh, um, agree with this. Um, you you also pointed out something in your view unsettling, namely universities, and this is connected with with this reading of of the university discourse matrix, that universities are becoming vocational schools. But I think, isn't that more honest? <laughs> In a sense, it seems to me that universities have always been vocational schools. And I think the main difference would be that in a vocational school, when um, a, a student is hystericized, split, and doesn't know, the teacher would just say, because it is so because I say so. But at the level of the university, this is never spelled out. So I think there's a certain honesty in this move yeah. that, that at the same time gi gives us tools of critiquing university itself. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so the first point first, yes, the, but this was exactly my point that, and I made it very shortly here. I actually spoke at a conference some years ago here also uh, about bureaucracy, where I first used this term that I used here also, pseudo commodification. And that's a very important point for me, that it's exactly not commodification, strictly speaking, but it's a pseudo-commodification. And why, why is it important that it's pseudo? That we pretend that most of what we're doing is somehow possibly being commodified or is really commodified. So the secretaries will tell you, for example, remember that you have to register this and that, and you should calculate, and you should make budgets, and so on. Uh, but at the same time, the pseudo-commodification means that exactly like you said, there's also some kind of gift economy that we are still, like I also said, we are expected to perform our duties out of some kind of calling, if you will, for that we are true researchers, we are on the quest of truth, and we are creating progress for society and whatnot. And we are taking care of students, of course, outside of the strict, it's not like we come, we teach for 45 minutes, and then we go home and say, fuck off, we will never see you again because it would be completely unethical in some situations. And I think that was my point in that bureaucracy conference, that a similar logic has spread to many parts of public service in many countries. I cannot make a sort of like empirical uh, proof of this, but that, for example, if you take healthcare, that nurses have to abide strictly by rules, operations have a certain price, they must take a certain time, you have so much time to see the patient and so on. And if you don't abide by all these stringent rules, you have a problem with your uh, leadership. But the problem is that not only you have to do that, but you also have to be able to know when you have to break the rules nonetheless, because maybe a patient actually needs support or will die if you don't give her or him uh, medicine that is actually not uh, prescribed, uh, that you don't have the access or the authority to prescribe in this situation. You need a doctor, but you, if you will wait for the doctor to prescribe it, the patient might, might die in all these kind of cases. And they abound now, I think, in health service because everything is so uh, bureaucratized that uh, health care workers themselves are bureaucrats to a large extent, like university teachers. So, the, And the second point, has, isn't it more honest? Yes, in a way, and I think I'm proudly aware that some of my uh, background and some of the places I've been working are very progressive in this sense, that almost directly speaking of university education as some kind of vocational Hasn't it always been? Well, yes, in some sense, but for example, if we take the classical European university, uh, take Kant's description in the faculty, uh, the, the, uh, the Streit der Fakultäten, you have three vocational uh, faculties, right? You have uh, law and you have uh, medicine and you have theology, but then you have the philosophical faculty, and the whole point of having a philosophical faculty was to have this free critical dimension in, uh, inscribed into the very rationality of the university itself. And maybe there's something that, for example, this is another story, but for example, Copenhagen University changed the name of the philosophical faculty as late as I think 1970, 71, and changed it to the Faculty of Humanitarian Sciences. 
And that is, that is rather important name change. It's an, again, it's a name that tells a whole story that we are now beginning to see uh, philosophy and related branches, theory, critical thinking and so on, as in a way also regional sciences like Heidegger would say. We're just studying culture, communication, humans as whatever groups uh, that might appear and not as some kind of general open critical study. So in a sense, yes, it would be more uh, honest uh, and okay, let's do that. And then we maybe we could start really thinking, should we invent a new kind of philosophical faculty, for example? Maybe privately, why not? Thank you. Uh, you well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it was uh, really a greatly depressing uh, <laughs> talk. Um, I want to ask a question sort of hanging on the, the very suggestive, very sort of very, very good title you've chosen uh, and also refer to the dream. Of course, this is a dream that is in some way a dream about dreaming, right? About how we keep on dreaming even when somehow reality calls upon us to wake up. And I want to ask precisely about the way we subjectify these objective, really, I, I, I believe them to be objective processes that you so well describe. And I mean by this, I'll give you an example. I, I'm speaking as somewhat of an outsider because I don't have a position. Uh, but I once had a, a very nice conversation with someone after one of my ordeals with, that, with the university system uh, about the process of hiring. And, you know, he told me something that I really liked. He said, this whole talk about quantity and the way we measure when it comes to candidates, but I think this is more than just this example. It functions a little bit like, you know, the man in the castle. There is this imagined rector sitting out there who will test and see if he really, you know, if they really measure up. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm saying something quite naive, but I think it's important. The, these objective processes work by means of us subjectivizing. Yeah. To taking them upon ourselves, even when we think they are horrible. And then the question really becomes, how do we nonetheless wake up? <laughs> and, and to that, I really, I, I, I am asking an even more naive question, which is, who amongst us here, not, this is really not just for you, can explain to the non-initiated, <laughs> and maybe even to the initiated, what are we good for? Mm -hmm. What is this spirit, the humanities, that we valorize? Now, I don't, I don't have self-doubts in that sense, but yeah. do we have that? Do no, we have exactly, yeah. that passionate and, uh, reply? Because I have to say that the idea of just a different knowledge, again, suggest, uh, not to disqualify it, is certainly not enough. Yeah. No, it, I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a gloomy situation, I would also say. And I, I don't have much optimism, uh, like a couple of other people speaking earlier, <laughs> sitting in that side of the auditorium. Uh, but yeah, I mean, very naively, for example, I'm part of this Danish Philosophical Association, and we're sort of launching a campaign now to simply explain to the public why philosophy, what, what for do we need it, and try to f refrain from any kind of employability discourse, so to say, not because of certain concrete, immediate utilitarian values, but for something more <laughs> difficult to explain, but which relates exactly to this discussion about the philosophical faculty, the whole meaning of uh, enlightenment, uh, truth, uh, democracy, and you know, th it, we have to go to these kinds of levels, I think, to actually try to explain that. And then about, uh, so to, there was, Peter also mentioned, I mean, the, the dream itself, I actually thought about going into sort of making a much more detailed analysis of Freud's explanation of the dream. Lacan has a different explanation. Zizek has his <laughs> version. Um, and it might be, I, didn't, I decided not to because I couldn't find exactly the extremely important point that I would find from going into the dream very elaborately. But there's something to be said about the, exactly, I think, what you're describing, that there's an important dimension of the subjective uh, imagination of who is wanting what from me at which point. I mean, there's already the point that the dream literally is the father's dream, of course. So he is dreaming that the child is uh, crying for him. The child is dead, which is <laughs> maybe an even more gloomy 
<laughs> perspective if you translate that to my use of it. But also, I mean, this, uh, that was also my point about using the von Trias, for example, but the boss of everything, that you always find a referral of power. It's always somewhere else. And I mean, I've been sitting in the study board in our university, in our education, for almost nine, 10 years now. And I have a lot of examples I would maybe want to use at one point if I wouldn't be indiscreet, <laughs> so to say. But, but for example, I mean, it's always like this. Maybe the, now, for example, the last word that was presented to us is the word paper trail. And I'm not even able to explain exactly what it means, but it's relatively obvious, probably. Maybe there will be a paper trail at one point from the ministry where they will come and check all of our communication, maybe even emails between us, em employ employees, and especially something like mo uh, minutes from our meetings about this and that and so on, and check if we are all always aware of all the procedural uh, correctness that we are uh, subdued to. And this idea, in the, if you just go one level above me in the faculty, th this is extremely important. Everything functions like this. Maybe from the rector's office, maybe from the ministry, maybe from somewhere else might appear something that would want to demand something from us. Therefore, we must do so and so. This is extremely pervasive now, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last, okay. Two last questions, but very quick ones. Um, Andrew was holding his microphone for a while, yeah, yeah. and then um, maybe maybe Anka, uh, and then uh, we will uh, we will have a half an hour break. Yeah. Uh, just a few quick points and then a comment, or maybe two quick points and a whatever. But just I'll t start talking. Um, the shift from quality to quantity is an interesting one, and 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 in a larger frame of reference, which may or may not matter, but just. You know, the whole project of Mathesis Universalis by Descartes, which is the mathematization of all areas of human knowledge, which is, I think, the first signal instance of a philosopher trying to use quantification as, as the basis of a university approach to the sciences and to the arts and, and grammar and everything else. So I thought that was a kind of potential, just even just an anecdote on that transition, which is not from um, quantity to quality, but from quality to quantity, which is a strange thing to do in light of uh, Aristotle's categories, which all of them are qualitative categories, except for the category of quantity. So it's, it's a big move, uh, especially since the Descartes' period was really important for uh, the proliferation of commentaries on Aristotle. In r light of the, you mentioning the 22 cuts, uh, a position, a cut of 22 positions at your university, I was wondering, thinking, I, I heard that and thought that alongside the news in, in my field, literary, generally speaking, of Rita Felsky having 28 million krona to uh, study literature at this, as a non-political uh, <laughs> form of human cultural production and that reading should be, uh, should reject ideology critique, uh, social criticism, anything of that sort. 28 million uh, buckaroos in your terms, right? Um, at University of Southern Denmark. Like, can you, like, do you have thoughts on that? Like, what, what like, <laughs> <laughs> That's 22 freaking positions, maybe. I don't know. That seems like yeah, a lot of money to me. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there's maybe even an interesting parallel to the story about Benjamin, Benjamin and the, the rephrasing of fascism and communism and so on. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think somebody maybe will do it, but we have to do it somehow to make a more elaborate effort at a th maybe simply describing what you could call the the political economy of the universities now, because someone else is doing it and they're not doing it well. I mean, we have a lot of discussion now at home and I think it's similar in many countries, in, certainly in Hungary, Poland, in the extreme cases, of what value do we actually get from all these gender studies and migration studies. Uh, that, that's usually the two main uh, uh, points. And, and they are ready <laughs> to to describe it like you were saying, that why are we spending money for this? We could get so many nurses for that and so on. So one part is that I think someone has to be doing sort of an offensive and defend, I mean, literally now defend, for example, gender studies and migration studies. I think that's actually a case of solidarity that is simply needed right now in many places probably. And then more generally that we should be more elaborate and precise and objective and so on about these kinds of questions that you also describe. 
Thank you. Anka, last question, please. Yeah, so, uh, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm all with you on, you know, the quantification of knowledge. But when I'm thinking kind of uh, on the ground, I, I'm honestly less worried about my colleagues who are like, you know, always applying for grants and are, you know, kind of, you know, kind of existing within the kind of dynamic you describe. And, you know, I, I, I do agree that that kind of rhythm makes for less you know, thinking and so on and so forth, and you know the the kind of time that is needed. Uh, but at the same time, I, it seems like you know, even accidentally, you know, there there there's insights and there's knowledge yeah, yeah. and so on and so forth. And I am more concerned by some of my colleagues who have not produced anything in 30 years. Yeah. And often, if you listen to their narratives, you know, they're working on some masterpiece that's like taking a long time. And so I, I'm kind of curious to hear your, your thoughts on what might be kind of a doubling of your argument and instrumentalization in the service of, honestly, like, you know, we have tenure, so abusing yeah. the tenure system and not doing much, right? When, when all the young scholars are like really waiting for an opening and applying yeah. for grants and so on and so forth, right? But I, I think that's a brilliant question, I think, and I'm not sure what my, position to that would be because, I mean, I'm well aware, for example, when I, I was employed in my position where I'm now, uh, I told my former colleagues that, can you imagine the kind of elaborate uh, bureaucracy that is here that we have to register each hour of what we're doing and so on? And then one of my friends said that, yeah, but remember how the old professors here are not teaching at all almost, and they're doing, letting the young colleagues do the hard work and uh, escaping themselves. So uh, certainly that should be included, and that's, I mean, that's part of the whole question of the master and authority and the importance of professorships and so on. But I think, again, we should not accept the blackmail of uh, the fear of this kind. I mean, there's something similar, even in other professions like health service, for example. We don't want nurses to sit around and drink coffee and uh, just sit and chit-chat with patients and so on. Yes, we do actually need that a little bit. And I mean, yes, I agree that there has probably been a lot of waste of time from lazy professors pretending to be working on something and not really contributing. And I think it's a serious challenge to that. And also I agree that, like I said also, the individual quality of papers and conferences and so on, actually I'm quite sure is often very much improved by a lot of the processes that we have ensured in our current <laughs> university discourse. But still, we have to address the other problem because I'm really worried about this. And I'm much more, I'm sorry, this probably we disagree. I'm much more worried about that mm -hmm. than maybe some stupid old pastors would still sit and drink coffee and tell anecdotes from the old days to the students. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and yeah, this is it. So a big applause for Henrik. <laughs> <laughs>